Hello, everyone, and welcome to ICS Live. This event is part of a series of live streamed content prepared by the ICS. You can see the other live events scheduled on the ICS website. Today, we will be discussing the physical therapy management of patients with interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, and comparing AUA guidelines to EAU guidelines. We invite you to be part of the discussion today by adding your comments to the section below in the website and we will read and respond to the questions as they come in. Thank you to the ICS for this opportunity and to share and discuss these informative topics. My name is Bertha Golem and I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist at Caterinos Physical Therapy in the Chicagoland area. I have the pleasure of working with both Eileen Huffman and Rhonda Caterinos who are joining us today. They have decades of not only clinical but also research and educational experience. Hi, my name is Eileen Huffman. I'm a physical therapist, and I've been practicing for approximately 18 years. Hi, my name is Rhonda Caterinos, and I have uh, been a physical therapist for 46 years, uh, 40 years of that in the ob gyne world, and approximately 36 years in the world of pelvic floor physical therapy. And welcome, and I appreciate this opportunity to uh, have this discussion and share this information with our colleagues. Unfortunately, okay. uh, and this is our disclosure side. Yeah. Quoting Albert Einstein, to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. This first study was designed to compare two methods of manual therapy, myofascial physical therapy and global therapeutic massage in patients with urological chronic pelvic pain syndrome. 48 subjects with chronic prostitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, or interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome were recruited. Eligible patients were randomized to receive myofascial physical therapy or global therapeutic massage and were scheduled to receive up to 10 weekly treatments of one hour each. Results demonstrated the global response assessment rate of 57% in the myofascial physical therapy group was significantly higher than the rate of 21% in the global therapeutic massage treatment group. Of note, the greater percentage of responders were females in the study, which led to the next study of investigation. The purpose of this study was to determine the efficacy and safety of pelvic floor myofascial physical therapy compared to global therapeutic massage in women with newly symptomatic interstitial system cystitis bladder pain syndrome. A total of 81 women who had similar symptoms at baseline were randomized to two group groups. One group received global therapeutic massage versus the other group received myofascial physical therapy interventions. Overall, the global response assessment rate was 26% in the global therapeutic massage group, whereas the myofascial physical therapy group had a 59% response rate. In part, based upon these studies, physical therapy interventions, including myofascial physical therapy techniques, have been established for the treatment of women with interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. During today's talk, it will be discussed in greater detail the physical therapy tools that are utilized in treating this patient population. Um, I wrote the uh, guideline for those two studies and that guideline was um, the protocol for the guideline was developed over years of having patients that came to me from having been to physical therapy or other treatments elsewhere that did not have great success. 
So as a result of that, the protocol became developed. And what we're going to be looking at today, this is the algorithm that is from the large document of the AUA's guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. We are primarily going to be dealing with the right-hand side of this algorithm. The middle and left-hand side primarily is dealing with a complica complicated IC uh, bladder pain syndrome patient, whereas the right-hand side is uncomplicated. And then we have the European Association of Urology's guidelines. Their guideline is a more global guideline on chronic pelvic pain. And this central uh, algorithm that you're looking at here is specific to the chronic pelvic pain syndrome of bladder pain syndrome IC. And we, again, will be dealing with the central portion of this um, algorithm rather than the left-hand side, which is dealing with the concept of a classic uh, ulcerative type of IC, whereas the midline and to the right will be addressing the uh, uncomplicated or uh, non-ulcerative uh, bladder pain syndrome. So when you compare the two, it is interesting in that um, uh, the AUA guidelines are extremely conservative in the very beginning. At their uh, most invasive activity at the time will be a potential physical exam, and then of course a urinalysis and a urine culture. Whereas at the first visit, based upon the um, AUA guidelines, they become a little bit more invasive and high tech. Uh, pain management is addressed in the very beginning at the very first visit. And based upon the EAU guidelines, a pain team does not come into play until there's been inadequate response uh, from other conservative managements. And they uh, do not give a great description of what the uh, conservative management or non-invasive therapy is other than the oral agents and the TENS um, units. The, um, <laughs> Uh, physical therapy is considered a second line treatment according to the AUA, but is going to most likely, in most of the physicians that I deal with, will be offered at the very first visit uh, with the physician. And no system, uh, urodynamics or um, system mutograms or um, cystoscopy are done until there has been failure of the conservative management. So those are the biggest differences between those two guidelines. Now Bertha is going to give us the um, case history of one of her patients. The patient I will be presenting on today is a G3P3, 35 year old female with symptoms of urinary frequency, urgency, dysuria, bladder pressure, incomplete bladder emptying, and constipation. She's been experiencing these symptoms for approximately two years before seeking physical therapy treatment. Initially, she reports being treated with antibiotics every month, even with negative urine cultures. A patient's first urology visit, importance of constipation management and adequate water intake was discussed for UTI prevention. She was also treated empirically with macrobid. This is in accordance with the AUA guidelines that were mentioned by Rhonda of first-line treatments, which include patient education, self-care, and pain management. She returned to the clinic, to the urology clinic, a year later. Same symptoms. Um, urine culture was again negative. The genital urinary exam showed no levator ani tension or pain. And patient at this point was advised to avoid antibiotic treatment in the absence of a positive urine culture. Urabel samples were provided for dysuria relief. And while this treatment strategy continues to be conservative, at this point, if the urologist was following AUA guidelines, manual physical therapy techniques would be the appropriate second line treatment and is classified as a clinical principal standard with a grade A rating. Patient returned for a follow-up two weeks later. Same symptoms. Urine culture again was negative. This time a pelvic floor relaxation handout was issued. However, there was no demonstration with the handout and the discussion regarding the purpose of the exercise was also not discussed with the patient. 
Um, she was also prescribed methanical chloride to improve her bladder emptying. Two months later, a uh, patient returned and she did note some improvement with methanical, uh, but she continued to report incomplete bladder emptying. Um, at this point, the urologist recommended urodynamic testing, which according to AUA diagnosis guidelines should only be considered as an aid to diagnose for complex cases and are not, it's not, an assess, it's not necessary in uncomplicated presentations. Luckily, pelvic floor physical therapy was also recommended. And unfortunately, again, this was after 14 months of symptom management, but she was then referred to the clinic. When patient came in for her initial evaluation, in addition to her previously noted symptoms of urinary frequency, urgency, dysuria, and incomplete bladder emptying, she also reported a weak urinary flow, vaginal dryness, and dyspareunia. She described these onset of symptoms as attacks in which she would sit at the toilet for five or six hours at a time. Her symptoms were worse in the morning and occasionally postcoital. She did admit to straining to end urination. And her ob history was significant for large unspecified perineal tears with her first two vaginal deliveries. She has no prior history of pelvic floor physical therapy treatment. The physical examination findings included tender connective tissue restrictions over right periumbilical tissue and super, left suprapubic tissue. She had trigger points present over bilateral proximal hip adductors, medial ischial tuberosities, and right bulbocavernosis. There was significant tenderness to palpation over the perineal body with decreased mobility, and she was very apprehensive about the transvaginal exam and any palpation to the area. Tender myofascial restrictions were present over the periurethral tissue and perineal membrane with adherent scar tissue over the left perineum. When the patient was cued for a concentric or an active shortening contraction of the pelvic floor, she exhibited a delayed relaxation after muscle activation. When she was cued for active lengthening or an eccentric contraction of the pelvic floor muscles, she demonstrated limited excursion and mild straining. One month into treatment, the patient experienced gross hematuria, it was postcoital, and a cystoscopy was performed. It was negative for any significant findings. Um, and the urology treatment plan at that time was to continue with pelvic floor physical therapy as the patient was responding well to treatment and symptoms were improving. Rhonda will be discussing more in detail the second line treatment guidelines for physical therapy. So the um, guidelines are based upon a level uh, two evidence because there were two well-conducted randomized controlled trials. And as Bertha has already stated, the appropriate manual physical therapy techniques, for example, maneuvers that resolve pelvic, abdominal, and or hip muscular trigger points, lengthen muscle contractures, and relieve painful scars and other connective tissue restrictions, if appropriately trained clinicians are available, should be offered. Pelvic floor strengthening and exercises such as Kegels should be avoided. That is considered a standard. A standard is a directive statement that an action should, meaning the benefits outweigh the risk burden, or should not, where the risk benefits outweigh, uh, the risk burden outweighs the benefits, should be taken. Um, at this point, this is a standard that this would be the activity that should be done, and it is of a grade level, which is considered high quality and high certainty. So now, let's break this down to what it's actually discussing. Well, first they mentioned trigger points. So what is a trigger point? A trigger point is a hyper irritable spot in skeletal muscle that is associated with a hypersensitive palpable nodule in a taut band. This is located either most commonly in the clinic with digital compression or needling. And what you will get when you provoke the trigger point is referred pain, referred tenderness, 
There can also be motor dysfunction associated with the trigger point in the referral zone, which is usually considered as inhibition of muscle activity. And there is autonomic dysfunction that can also go along with it, which is typically referred to or dealing with the increased glandular activity uh, that will be in the referral zone associated with the trigger point. When you provoke the trigger point, you may also elicit a local twitch response, and that is going to be a very lo localized contraction of muscle fibers within the muscle that you are provoking. A jump sign is the response of the patient when they literally have a full uh, disclaimer that they are in pain and they are going to jump and to po try to potentially get away from you. There are ways of seeing a trigger point, and this is a picture taken with 2D um, grayscale ultrasound in elasto, vi uh, elasto, um, um, elasto vibro, elastic vibro, vi I cannot say it right now, but anyway, it is, a, but this is research. This is not gonna be utilized in a clinic, uh, at least not in my clinic. And right now I totally rely upon the palpation, the use of my hands to locate a trigger point. So what are some of the common trigger points? Um, this is taken from the triggerpoint.net or the Travell and Simons textbooks, uh, showing that there are trigger points in the adductors, the iliopsoas, uh, pelvic floor, as well as lateral abdominal muscles that all can be potentially uh, sources of symptoms in the bladder pain syndrome patient. So what kinds of activities would potentially initiate those trigger points? Well, if you look here at the adductor and you look above, you see soccer player. So it could be a soccer player, or it could be naturally be a cheerleader. In fact, I'm sad to say I've had several cheerleaders that had created adductor trigger points um, with their split jumps during their routines and unfortunately having severe pain and sometimes urinary symptoms. And unfortunately, many of them have undergone complete removal of all female organs for a lack of understanding that was potentially a muscle creating the pain problem. Um, prolonged sitting, um, you can definitely get a trigger point in the iliopsoas, and that is definitely known to have a referral into the groin, which can be perceived as the bladder or potentially, especially in men, there can be uh, a referral into the testicles. And sad to say, many men have had their testicles removed as a result of a trigger point. Um, and the iliopsoas. And then there's guarding. There's several kinds of guarding. We have guarding that would be protective guarding. So if someone had a chronic pain syndrome of some sort, they will potentially actively recruit their pelvic floor muscles as well as many other muscles to try to protect them from the pain. Or we have the guarding reflex, which is associated with um, the normal reflexive activity of the pelvic floor for the inhibition of the bladder for there to be bladder filling. There can be a point in time when you have those people who are chronic postponers that they will add additional active contraction of the pelvic floor to try to get a better inhibition to the urge that they keep putting off and not going to the bathroom. And then you have your lateral abdominals. And at the top you see there it says bodybuilder. I technically don't get them very often, but what I do get are the young men and women who are getting ready for their uh, spring break where they're going off to the Caribbean or to some beach and they are going to be doing 500 sit-ups a day to make sure they have a great looking belly and they create a trigger point in their lowest, lower lateral rectus and internal oblique muscles that all can refer to the bladder, give you um, pain as well as spontaneous contractions, potentially even creating some incontinence. So what are some of the treatment techniques that you can utilize for a trigger point? Orig originally in the textbooks, uh, Travell and Simons referred to ischemic compression, and that was applying an, an adequate amount of pressure to create a localized ischemic response in the area of the trigger point. That was abandoned because with further research, they found that the trigger point already had a compromise to the blood supply, and there was no need to add an additional compromise. And they replaced the treatment technique with what is referred to as a barrier release. A very release technique is where you applied a pressure into the trigger point to meet the pressure back from the trigger point and then apply either a submaximal contraction and with the relaxation of that submaximal contraction, you can give a little assist or a stretch to the trigger point to um, capitalize on the neurophysiologic release mechanism that's going along with the relaxation 
or you could ask for a reciprocal inhibition activity from the agonist to the muscle that you happen to be treating. treating. You can just do some passive manual stretching localized to the trigger point region. There can be myofascial release. You can do connective tissue work in the referral zone to the trigger point, which according to David Simons and Travell uh, is referred to as subcutaneous paniculosis. And then you can also do fascial stretching and muscle play of the muscles that are involved. And of course, therapeutic stretching and auto stretching. Above and beyond that, there can also be injection techniques in our practice. Our physicians use quarter percent bupivacaine, five cc's per site that we direct the injection to be done. And based on body size, usually no more than 30 cc's at one injection time frame. Dry needling can also be utilized to treat um, trigger points. Um, there are several techniques. There are those techniques where the needle is just placed in the trigger point and left. There can be a pecking technique where the needle is moved around as it should be during the injection that you look for the very specific contraction knots and move your needle in a 360 area and depth to look for those contraction knots and to get them to release by a local church response. Or you can do a twisting technique. Once the needle is in, you can twist the needle and get a response that way. So going on. The next specific treatment option that is listed in the um, guideline, um, second line treatment guideline is connective tissue restrictions. So what are we talking about there? Well, how many of you happen to know uh, or even think about the visceral somatic reflex when dealing with this patient population? Uh, as you know, angina is a heart condition where that the pain is felt in the left shoulder, elbow, or jaw. Um, the gallbladder, the pain is felt in the posterior right shoulder. So the visceral somatic reflex is the result of afferent stimuli arising from the dysfunction of a visceral nature. So if you happen to have someone, and typically the bladder pain syndrome people don't have this, but what if there has been a history of urinary tract infections? And in our area, that's considered more than three in one year. So you now have had a pathological bladder several times in one year. So that pathology can create and set up a visceral somatic reflex. But then you can also have a somato visceral reflex. And that is the visceral cutaneous uh, reflex interconnection is reversible. That is to say that it not only leads from the internal organs to from the internal organs to the skin, but also vice versa. So how many of you know what the referral zone is to the bladder? I was in a room with about 500 urologists at the American Neurological Association meeting one year and asked that exact same question and not one person knew the referral zone. So as you see on the uh, picture on the right, this is the referral zone that was described by Sir Henry Head in 1893 for the bladder. And to the left, you see the picture where it's the low back and the lower extremities that is the referral zone for the prostate. So the referral zones for the female reproductive organs, according to Sir Henry Head, um, you have your lateral medial thighs, the SI joint area, the sacral area, as well as the lower pelvis and below the umbilicus, and basically the low back area as far as referral zones from the female reproductive organs. So what occurs? What are the connective tissue restrictions? Why are they there? Well, they're there because of trophic changes. And the trophic changes take place as a result of a lack of nutrition. So with the, the referral zone having a decreased blood flow as a result of reflex vasoconstriction, you get texture and structure changes of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. You can feel it. It's a thickening of the subcutaneous tissue. There's a decreased mobility. And you also note atrophy of the muscular tissue. There are techniques to treat this. Um, one technique is connective tissue manipulation according to, to the osteopath. That's also referred to as neuromuscular treatment. It's a manual technique to treat the connective tissue changes in the referral zones of visceral somatic and uh, somatovisceral reflexes, as well as trigger points in the, as a result of the reflex vasoconstriction. The other thing that you can consider in treating the potential connective tissue restrictions that may occur is because the saddle area is uh, an area of referral to the bladder, 
you will potentially want to minimize prolonged sitting time and um, um, potentially consider clothing options. Um, I have found that men will definitely get out of their whitey tidy jockey shorts quicker than a female will eliminate the underwear that has a very tight elastic around their thigh crease. Um, those all can create a uh, mechanical compression of the microvasculature in those areas that can prolong a pathology that could potentially refer into the bladder. So uh, Louisa Burns is a physician from a while ago, 2007. She stated that the somatovisceral reflexes are less circumcised and less direct than our visceral somatic reflexes. The normal visceral activity depends in part upon the stimulation derived from the somatosensory nerves that feed the, the reflex area. So what somatosensory nerve might be in this area, especially the saddle area, that we very rarely think about. And that is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, that is the nerve that is going to be compromised immediately upon prolonged sitting. It is probably not just the tissues that are having ischemic responses, but so are the uh, nerve branches of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. It is a sensory nerve. It has no motor function whatsoever. Um, and this is somewhat substantiated by research that was done by Tyen uh, et al, where they found that um, what they actually did in this study is they took cats and then they created irritable bladder conditions either by um, uh, an isovolumetric filling of the bladder to the point they get the reflex bladder contractions um, for needing to uh, avoid or they created an extremely irritable bladder by retrograde filling their bladders with acetic acid and again, getting reflex bladder contractions. And by providing either mechanical stimulation at the skin or electrical stimulation at the skin over the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve distribution, they were able to inhibit the bladder contractions created by those two irritable situations. So in our study, the primary thing that we were doing was specifically mechanical stimulation of the skin. There was no electrical treatment um, during either of the studies um, that were done. Now what you're looking at here is a little bit different. Um, you are looking at trophic changes in the saddle area, specifically over the ischial tuberosities of a young 26 year old female. She uh, had been married for four years and had never had vaginal penile sex in the entire four years of her marriage. Um, she and her husband had chosen to be celibate before and the wedding night, nothing was able to happen. Um, her primary concern was technically vulvodynia. The fact that there was urge and frequency did not seem to be her biggest problem. But once her physicians had told her she should consider doing um, a vestibulectomy, she thought that was quite extreme and then she sought other care. And what you're looking at in my eyes is the beginning of a bed sore. It takes two hours of 70 millimeter mercury pressure at the skin surface to start necrosis. And here, rather than the trophic changes coming from reflex vasoconstriction, you are actually getting a decrease in the subcutaneous tissue, a thinning of the skin and the integrity of the skin definitely compromised by being dry and scaly. And again, her primary complaint was vulvodynia. So our process was to deal with the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve to increase its blood supply so that in the reperineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, there would not be that excessive sensitivity. And then of course, as we're resolving those issues, we were also working with resolving her urge and frequency, but again, that was secondary in her eyes. So we have had a study that as actually does look at sitting time, physical activity, and the risk of lower urinary tract symptoms. Now, this was specifically done in approximately 70,000 Korean men, and none of them had lower urinary tract symptoms at the beginning of the study. They were monitored and followed in a clinic over the course of approximately three years at the beginning of their um, cohort study. They were provided with the international physical uh, activity uh, questionnaire short form to get a baseline and then uh, the international prostate symptom score to also get a baseline. 
And then um, in follow-ups, what they eventually found that decreased physical activity and prolonged sitting time were independently associated with the development of uh, LUTs. And one of the key things they did find when you are sitting at greater than or equal to 10 hours a day, especially in the older men, they had a very, very high significance of developing um, lower urinary tract um, symptoms. So we now have a somatovisceral reflex. And in my world, I get, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with in the United States, account, um, our taxes are due every April 15th. So accountants start sitting a lot in January and by the end of April and early part of May, my office can be inundated with accountants that have a high incidence of lower urinary tract uh, symptoms. And of course, every single one of their cultures has come up absolutely negative. So now we're to lengthen muscle contractures. So the pelvic floor muscles are like any other skeletal muscle in the human body. This is from Richard Lieber, who is a um, skeletal muscle specialist out of the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. He specifically works in the orthopedic surgery world uh, with regards to tendon transplants to make um, cerebral palsy and other dysfunctions more functional by changing the locations of skeletal muscle. And uh, at a uh, conference in uh, 2018, the American Neurogynecology Conference, question was asked, are the pelvic floor skeletal muscles like any other skeletal muscle? And he resoundedly said, yes. So that's why you're looking at the skeletal muscle of the pelvic floor and the glutes, hamstrings, and quads. They essentially are exactly the same type of muscle. Now, of course, the difference can be the fiber makeup. Um, pelvic floor may definitely be and is definitely more type one, where the quads and the hamstrings are type two fiber types. But what's, what happens is that uh, you get to a point where if everyone has been treated with the idea and concept that Kegel exercises or pelvic floor muscle training is the go-to treatment, you end up with overutilized and contraindication for that treatment technique. And you can repeat a muscle contraction over and over and over again, or add that protective guarding excessively if you are a postponer for urination, you get a short pelvic floor or a contracture. Now, if we go back to our simple skeletal muscle physiology, we all know that muscle works on a Goldilocks effect. You have an optimal length where the muscle gives you the greatest amount of force and function. So if the muscle is too long, uh, as on the um, left hand, on the right hand side of the screen, way overstretched, which may be many times after a baby's been pushed out of the pelvis, you're gonna have a decreased force generation. Or on the far left of the uh, graph, you see number four, if your actinomycin filaments are so far cross-linked over into a very shortened space, they also generate force. So that is the physiology of the skeletal muscle that indicates that a contracture can occur. So what is? contractile activity. You can have muscle tension from an electrogenic muscle contraction, so that I voluntarily reach up to scratch my head, or I add voluntary contraction of my pelvic floor to inhibit urge. Then you can have an electrogenic spasm, pathological involuntary electrogenic contraction. This, when I get patients being told that they have a spasm of the pelvic floor, I rarely feel that is true because if it truly is a spasm, they are probably not quite capable of urinating or defecating. Can that occur? Yes, but I have to admit, I very rarely get those patients. But a contracture is within muscle fibers, but there are no EMG activity associated with that contracture. So this is where biofeedback may be a problem because biofeedback can be great for uh, dealing with the hypertonic pelvic floor, but the hypertonicity can get turned off and you typically are doing maximal contraction with maximal relaxation to facilitate that hypertonicity resolution, but you have done nothing to reverse the contraction, uh, the contracture, excuse me. Um, the muscles, fibers get up to a point where they decide they no longer need to have that electrical activity and stay, and it turns off in that shortened uh, actinomyosin filament positioning. 
So what is a contracture? According to Gasser in 1930, contractile responses that are prolonged, reversible, and non-propagated. According to Ernst Fischer, muscle that has gone from an active to an inactive state. Uh, decrease in muscle length where range of motion in the direction of elongation is limited, according to Florence Kindle. Muscle is in a consistent state of shortening, limiting range of motion, and resisting stretching, and then endogenous stretching of muscular contractile apparatus, apparatus without EMG activity. So we've all, as physical therapists, and my rehab days absolutely have come across contractures of the pelvic floor. And there can be a contracture, and when you palpate it, there may not be any tenderness, but it may not function well. So why would the pelvic floor go into a state of contracture? Well, the pelvic floor, as we said, is mostly slow twitch fibers, depending on you read 66 or 70%. Slow twitch fibers become hypertonic, short and tight. Slow twitch fibers are capable of sustained contractions, which is what we know about the pelvic floor. Sustained contractions can lead to a shortened and tight muscle and contracture develops slowly, maintained by constant neural stimulation, and contracture is muscle shortening, maintained by a continuous stream of nerve impulses. Definitely has a very likelihood of um, going into a state of contracture when conditions are appropriate. So there is another skeletal muscle physiology activity that can have an impact on the function of the pelvic floor, and you can watch the video. So what you saw there is in the 1800s was considering the floating arm parlor trick. This was done at uh, cocktail parties to um, demonstrate. Uh, it is also referred to as postural active contraction, after contraction, and was originally described by uh, Kunstam in 1915. It's the involuntary movement checked by a short transient response, reflex response. It can be elicited from any skeletal muscle with suitable induction. It will occur best in proximal joints and requires an isometric contraction of 50 to 100% of the maximum voluntary contraction for at least 30 to 60 seconds. In the United States, we do this in our fifth, sixth grade science classes. And um, I will have to admit my science teachers did not give me the explanations that you get from Kunstam or from um, Hagbar where it basically is a tonic reflex um, that is associated um, with the muscle spindles. So that when you are doing or executing your isometric contraction for that 30 to 60 seconds, your muscle spindle is generating and saving a lot of energy. When you walk away from the resistance, the muscle spindle says, I have got to execute this and get rid of this excess energy and your abductors allow your arms to go up. So, can there be a place where this can be occurring in the overactive bladder syndrome patient? Um, for instance, with Bertha's patient where she has this idea and concept of incomplete emptying and may not empty completely is that if she has been adding an active uh, isometric contraction to try and make that sensation of urge go away, when she goes to release to initiate urination, muscle spindles may say, no, 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 pop it back up the bladder contraction stops and she walks away without complete emptying. So where and how do you diagnose um, an internal pelvic exam? This is definitely not the standard in uh, any of the uh, documentations about how to do a pelvic exam, but with fingers inside the vagina or with inside the anus, you ask for a shortening contraction, squeeze, uh, lift my fingers, whatever your uh, cue will be. And you, of course, are going to assess the force, the range, the quality, the speed at which they executed that contraction. And then you evaluate how well they relax the uh, relaxation of the post shortening contraction. Once they are at their resting, then you can ask for an active lengthening or CE eccentric contraction of the pelvic floor which for me, I will ask them to drop their pelvic floor as if, as if they are initiating urination, which is not easy because they're flat on their back 
in a room with me with my finger in the vagina. And that is not when they have normally executed that motor uh, plan for that muscle. So it, there can be some cues that need to go on with that. The key thing that is also uh, noticed is that when you have an extremely weak pelvic floor because it's overstretched, the substitution pattern, as we know, is the adductors, glutes, and the abdominal wall. The substitution pattern in a very short uh, pelvic floor is there's rib cage, uh, rib cage elevation. They are trying to get the pelvic floor to come up because that's what you're asking for. And um, the um, rib cage gives them the sensation that they are assisting with that action. So um, how do you manage it? Any method that will increase inhibition of a muscle contracture will remove the shortening. So reflexively, we can do that through the connective tissue work, through the trigger point release work. Um, you can also get a reflexive uh, release of the pelvic floor by bilateral low extremity PNF D2 symmetrical resistance to primarily flexion and abduction, but not to the internal rotation component. You can also ask for active lengthening. In the very early stages, I'm actually asking them to double void. And in this situation, I tell them to initiate urination. Do not change the way they urinate unless they strain. If they're strainers to void, we have to correct that before. And they're probably strainers because their pelvic floors are so tight and so short. They cannot turn it off enough to elicit a bladder contraction. So we have to correct that first. But if they are capable, of voiding without strain, you ask them to double void. When they finish urinating, you just ask them to initiate or try to void again, but that trying to get urine out is not the goal. It's only to execute the motion of the pelvic floor. Squats will also facilitate pelvic floor release and you can actually do active drops in the squat position. So here is a pelvic floor. Definitely a lot less motion on the drop of the pelvic floor as related to the bear down. Now there is no audio for this one. That is a strain, that is a bear down. There is your active drop, your active lengthening. So it's a fine motor control, well-coordinated release of the pelvic floor or a lengthening contraction of the pelvic floor. All right, we're back to you, Bertha, for to complete your case study. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, so I saw this patient for a total of 12 treatment sessions, and the treatment consisted primarily of connective tissue manipulation over bilateral quadratus lumborum, lumbar paraspinals, the sacrococcygeal and posterior lateral hip border, gluteal folds, posterior thighs, inner thighs, medial ischial tuberosities, and abdominal wall. Transvaginal Myofascial manipulation of the pelvic floor muscles was also performed, as well as trigger point release and dry needling as needed or as found in the tissue. A neuromuscular reeducation was also implemented, focusing on lengthening of the pelvic floor musculature. So I would have them cue them for a lengthening contracture and then give manipulative assist as I was um, internally asking them to perform that. Um, I also would issue therapeutic exercise, such as what Rhonda had noted with the deep squatting to help facilitate pelvic floor drops. Um, and occasionally even before they would sit on the toilet um, to, for bowel or bladder. And patient education was reinforced and provided at each visit, um, whether it was toileting posture, double voiding, uh, the anatomy and physiology of the pelvic floor and the bladder function and bowel function all with a goal of optimizing bladder, bowel, and sexual health. Um, we discussed early on the use of lubricants uh, with because of her postcoital flare-ups, uh, 
and water-based versus silicone, all of those things were discussed depending on how the patient presented or what was flaring up the patient at that time um, at each visit. And overall, currently she reports that symptoms are approximately 95% better. And that includes bladder emptying, improved urinary flow, resolution of dyspareunia, and bladder pressure. She is no longer taking any prescription medications and she actually stopped taking those, I believe after the third or fourth visit. Um, she does currently still experience some episodes of constipation and she's managing it well for the most part. I'd say over the last two to three visits, she's presented with primary symptoms of occasional left gluteal and posterior thigh symptoms. And I think it's possible that over the last few months, she's been more sedentary and possibly sitting for prolonged periods of time because of the stay at home orders and um, just with social distancing due to COVID. So that may be what's contributing to that, but it's occasional and it has not limited her from doing other things. Um, she is scheduled to follow up in six weeks and we've gradually been increasing the time between visits. And when COVID here was at its peak in terms of the concerns, she went about nine weeks without treatment. And during that stressful period uh, without treatment, she managed her symptoms quite well for that length of time. Back to you, Rhonda. So, bam, that's the recipe that we have developed um, for managing, managing bladder pain syndrome. Myofascial manipulation, as we discussed, would be the trigger point release techniques that can also be manual as well as dry needling and injection. Connective tissue manipulation, which would be manual therapy to the involved tissues, whether it be in the referral zone associated with the organ or the uh, referral zone associated with a trigger point. And coupled in with that, specifically into the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve distribution, the integration of neural manipulation and stretching uh, with your manual therapy. And then the key thing is making the determination in your evaluation as to whether or not this pelvic floor is a short pelvic floor, uh, to short, a long, weak pelvic floor that needs to be shortened via strengthening exercises, or do you need to lengthen a short, weak pelvic floor? Key thing to remember is weakness is on both ends. When you put your finger in the vagina, you have to make that decision. Do you feel that it's weak because it's too short or is it weak because it's too long? And then develop an appropriate pelvic floor muscle training program on those two findings. A repeated pattern in science is that far less evidence is required to establish an idea as a fact than is required to dislodge an idea once established. Something, something to think about, and I thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Um, we actually do have a couple of questions that came across that are um, nicely to be addressed. We have patient advocate Jane, ICS associate editor, asks, should patients first receive medical treatment due to the reduce, to reduce the pain and other symptoms before starting any physiotherapy? Um, for me specifically, um, since um, most of our patients have come from physicians, uh, they will already be on some pain management program medically. And um, so I, my true point, uh, opinion is it should be simultaneous. But if they've gone into the physician first and the physician has chosen to try Elevil for six weeks, um, my goal is if, if, if they're coming in to see me and they have been medically managed, then they haven't been man managed adequately enough and they want continued treatment. And when they do come already being medically managed on medications, I will not change any of that because I want them to be 100% on medications and then you start weaning off medications once they are. So it should be simultaneous. It's not one or the other. It should be at the get-go, physical therapy and medical management of the pain. Excellent, thank you. Um, we also do have another question from Philip, uh, who is a urologist and ICS trustee. 
Um, he has a multiple part question. Um, I'll read the question first. What would be the optimal treatment schedule? How often, how long, et cetera? And how would you individualize physical therapy approach? What is the criteria for individualization? Well, first of all, um, a statement from a DO is treat what you find, not what you're looking for. So the individualization is gonna be based upon what I find in that patient, what muscles happen to have trigger points. Um, where is there an overlap? Is there primarily a constipation problem along with some urinary complaints? So you're gonna direct your treatment to exactly what their patient complaints are. And for me, I use very little questionnaires. At the end of my intake, I look at the patient and I'll say, okay, we've discussed a lot of things that you don't like. Give me your number one thing. I'm snapping my fingers and it's gone today. And in some people it will be the pain and some people it'll be frequency, some people will be urge or urgency. So in the beginning, I will direct my treatment to what their goal is. And uh, how often? Um, everyone always asks, sure, if I saw you every single day, you will get better faster, but that's not practical. So in our practice, we see patients once a week, every visit is one hour long, and at the end of 10 visits, we have to look at each other, patient and therapist, and say, of your priority list that you gave me, and maybe the one is their urination is um, throughout the day, they're urinating every hour, and at nighttime, they're up four times. So I have some very objective numbers at the end of 10 visits. We both have to decide that there has been enough change that justifies continued therapy. So when you get, Bertha's patient was two years, I've had patients who've had um, bladder pain syndrome symptoms for 12 and 14 years. I'm not gonna get them to zero in 10 hours worth of physical therapy. But if I've gotten them to the point that most nights they are only getting up two times as compared to four times, that's a 50% reduction. And to me, that's enough of a positive change that I would feel comfortable continuing therapy but if the patient doesn't feel that way, I can't change their mind. But most of them are quite happy when we continue with therapy. I think I answered all of that. Yes, you did. Thank you very much for that. Um, we do have an additional question um, from Paula, who's a physiotherapist. And she says and asks, do you recommend the TheraWand as a self-help management strategy to your patients? No, I do not. Do you want more of an explanation why not? That would be great, Rhonda. Um, I, um, it is very difficult for them because the Theraon is primarily taught with the idea and concept of ischemic compression. And I definitely do not want the liability because uh, I literally have had patients who have had quadratus lumborum trigger points that have maintained constant pressure on that quadratus lumborum over the entire weekend. I had seen them on Friday, pointed out the trigger point taught them the stretching and the icing, but what did they find? They found that if they put constant steady pressure with their thumb onto that trigger point, they were much more comfortable. So they walk around all weekend long with pressure on that trigger point. They literally came in with a bed sore, with an ulcer, a blister from that constant steady pressure there. I do not want to take on the responsibility of a TheraWand being used as ischemic compression and developing a um, fistula between the vagina and the rectum or between the vagina and the bladder. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of the wand. I've, I've had a few patients come in that have previously been recommended a TheraWand, so they own it. And I think the problem that I've encountered is they use it when they're experiencing a flare up and they make it worse. And I almost wish with proper instruction, which I'm willing to give and I have offered, um, if they would use it more as a preventative management, if, if they can use it appropriately, not to use it once they're already in a, bit, a big flare and then they're making it worse, if that makes sense. I wish it could be, I wish they would use it properly preventatively like once a week or so with the uh, appropriate instruction. And then it might be beneficial. Excellent. Um, we have another question from Olga, who's also a physiotherapist. And I'll start with her first question, and then we'll lead on to the rest. Um, her first question is, is it useful to do an evaluation of the yellow flags as part of your physical therapy treatment? 
yellow so flags much. being the, the psychological, um, the emotional, um, those other components of centralization and peripheralization, um, sensitization of their pain. Is it useful? I start that mm -hmm. as soon as I possibly can. Um, in fact, one of the ways that I do that, um, I utilize a lot of examples. Um, one of my examples that I will utilize to explain central sensitization is, um, I actually have two. One is the uh, Chinese water torture, where that a poor man has been captured by the Chinese. They papoose him down and they put a drip of water hitting the forehead, which is maintained for hours and days and months to the point that that drip of water now has centrally sensitized their forehead, that the drip of water is excruciating and painful. Uh, and explain to them, you know, a drop of water is not painful. And so over time with you enduring and having your symptoms, it takes less and less of a stimulus to initiate your symptom. And we need to be analyzing that as we're going through our treatment, determine what those sensitization activities are that can set off your symptoms um, and explain that then that poor Chinese tortured person comes home and they have been debriefed, they have, de they have been desensitized, they are doing quite well, and they're very excited about going on a fishing trip with their father, and um, he's supposed to be driving to go pick up his dad, he gets a phone call, dad's had a massive coronary, he's being taken to the hospital, his stress level is going crazy, getting in the car to drive to dad, on the way down, his car breaks down, he has to stay in a hotel, and in the ho motel, uh, he has a horrible drippy faucet, and by the time he gets up in the morning, his forehead is in agonizing pain. So that once those sensory nerve fibers have been uh, sensitized, that it does not take much or it can take, um, uh, it can be reactivated by appropriate stimuli, which is stress um, and the association of the dripping water. Um, so yes, those are talked about and addressed in the very beginning. Okay, excellent. I think you kind of answered the next um, parts to uh, Olgo's questions, but I'm going to ask him anyways. Is there any experience with pain science education in patients like this, as well as do you consider peripheral and central sensitization apart from trigger point distribution patterns? No, there's definitely uh, science that says myofascial trigger points can have a major impact on initiating and setting up central sensitization. Um, so they're not, um, the central sensitization and treatment, that piece of the treatment to me is all part of it and comprehensive. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay. Rhonda, I have a question. Okay. It's just one that's gonna, comes up frequently. It came up with this patient and with a few of my others. So do you recommend um, in patients that have flare-ups after postcoital? Do you recommend, or that are prone to UTIs, do you recommend that they urinate after intercourse to help? Um, I would say a standard um, suggestion from physicians in the Chicagoland area is definitely that you should urinate before and after intercourse. Uh, I disagree with that. And I tell my patient that they can discuss it with their physician. But the reason why I disagree with it, I don't know what the sexual practices are, but based upon the research here, is that most sex takes place on the weekends. But uh, if you take a Wednesday night and wife goes upstairs to go to bed first, brushes teeth, washes face, goes to the bathroom, gets in bed, and who knows what husband saw on TV, but he's a little bit excited and he comes up and says, you know, hon, I know it's only Wednesday, but can, we have, can I have a quickie? And so it is a quickie 10 minutes later. So it's been a total of maybe 30 minutes since she urinated. Is her bladder full enough to go to the bathroom? No, it's not. So she's gonna go sit on the toilet because everyone is told to void before and after. And it is it that voiding afterward, which is maybe predisposing her to the urinary tract infection. And if they're concerned about me telling them not to do that, but they do want to void, I will tell them to get up, go to the kitchen, guzzle a big glass of water and be prepared to wake up in about an hour but their bladder will be really full and have a great stream and wash away any potential uh, pathogens that could, could be giving them a bladder infection. Wonderful, thank you.
Um, I take it there are no more questions. We're good for now. Thank you. All right. Well, we are at the end of our time, and I want to thank everybody for their attention and thank everyone for their questions. And should you have any more in the future, feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All.